everybody. This is Business of Design, episode number 95. What? That's crazy. It's good crazy, though, because we have had so much learning together. I can't thank you enough for blowing my mind with all of the amazing wisdom you've shared with us. We have a fabulous guest today. She was recommended to us by an awesome Business of Design member, Gail M. Davis from New York City. I love Gail. I'm not going to lie. And if Gail tells me that this woman, Nicole, is a fabulous woman, I know it's true. But now I've interviewed her and I'm telling you, she's awesome. Thank you, Gail, for the recommendation. We really appreciate it. We're going to talk today about how to do a brand audit with Nicole Heimer. There's so much good information in this episode. Nicole is extremely generous and she shares very specific detail about how to really inventory and assess whether or not your brand is working for you and to identify those areas where your brand might be just a little bit broken. She shares with us some insights on how to use Google Analytics effectively. She definitely got me thinking about those different touch points that clients bump into me at and what is my messaging like at those various touch points and how can I create a consistent, streamlined branding message across platforms that do very different things. My website, Kimberly Selden Design Group, is geared toward that customer who's looking for someone to do all of it for them where my Instagram page, as you will hear in this episode, is a lot more focused on, hey, I'm out, I'm drinking tequila, this is fun, I'm having a great time, Um, and I need to do, now that I've learned from Nicole, I myself need to do a little bit of work on that messaging as well. One of the big takeaways for me, and there were quite a few actually, but something I've thought about a lot since the conversation with Nicole, has to do with not putting homework on your customers, not making them work hard to get to what it is you want them to do when they come to your website. For so many years, I had a beautiful website, but no direct funnel that captured those people who came to my website to determine whether or not they wanted to work with me. And I can see now that I made them work too hard. I made them look through the whole site without telling them what I thought they should do, which is, hey, you should hire me for a consultation. I know so much more now, of course, uh, as do we all every single day. So that was one of the big takeaways. Another big takeaway, her design intervention. It's really good, and I won't give it away. I'll let Nicole tell you herself. I'm really glad you're here. Let's check in with Cheryl Horn. Cheryl, I'm having trouble remembering to write 2019. It's We're like halfway through the month now. I should be getting it together, don't you think? (laughs) I don't have to write the date down that often, though. Right, I know. So that's why it just, yeah, it takes a little while to get used to it. (laughs) I'll tell you what's easier. I'm getting the hang of Instagram. After only a week, I'm sort of making some progress. What are you up to on your Instagram account or our Instagram account? One of the biggest things that I found that made a difference right away, um, and hopefully most of our listeners have already done that, is just updating your profile so that people can find you. It's not just about your handle because it's also your name that's searchable. Um, And I would say it's sort of half and half. A lot of our members are using their business name and others are using their personal name. So it's really important if one of them is your handle, make sure the other one is your official name on, on Instagram because they are both searchable. So that was sort of one of the big tips that can start making a difference right away. So in our case, we are business of design, but that handle was taken. So we became design is my business, but we use the hashtag business of design. Those things are very important to us. Yeah, because if, if either one, and, and in most cases, people are finding us through searching business of design. Uh, so we make sure that both of those are um, both of those are relevant. And then also you get, you don't get a lot of characters to set that bio. So um, make sure it's really to the point as to what you do. Um, and you also get one link. So make sure that that is a really strong call to action to get people to your site. For a lot of designers that they're sharing their work and then to see the full project, you know, referencing the link in their bio. So make sure that that is a really strong call to action and also that it's trackable. You want to make sure that you're very aware of which posts 
posts are actually driving traffic to your site. Right. Otherwise, you're sort of wasting your energy if it's not effective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So everybody continue to use the hashtag BOD challenge. We're going to continue to follow along. And on next week's episode, we'll make sure that we check in, uh, see how everyone's doing, and also include a couple more of those uh, tips that we pulled from the master class. Okay. If you missed last week's podcast, episode 94 with Elise Dharma talking about how to grow your Insta following in a way that gets you more customers, go to businessofdesign.com, go to the podcast show notes, take Elise's free master course. There's a lot of good stuff in there. There's so much good stuff in there. Both Cheryl and I wanted to do more with Elise. So we're going to give you the benefit of the different coaching that we're doing with Elise. The next group coaching session is coming up on January 23rd. Registration's open. Um, So let's start 2019 off strong. Make sure you get in on that. If you've got any questions, if you set goals for this year, uh, we want to hear about it. So again, join us on January 23rd. You can register now. Um, And then just a quick reminder, February 15th, rates are going up. If you're a long-time listener and still thinking about membership, now is the time, and you can get locked into 2018 rates. It's really important that if you are an existing member, if you sign up before February 15th, your rate will not change as long as you are a member. Our goal at Business of Design is pretty ambitious. We want to change the industry one designer at a time, and we want to make it affordable for you guys to get in on this. So thank you so much, everybody, for your support. It's been overwhelming. I get so many amazing messages from members who say the loveliest things, and you guys just really keep pushing me to do more and learn more. So thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon, Kimberly. Bye. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate business challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses plus Kimberly Selden as your mentor and guide. Unlike traditional coaching, which can take years to produce tangible results, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $67.50. Annual members save two months and have access to Kimberly's contracts. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Nicole, I'm so happy you were able to do this today. Hi. Hi. So nice to be here. Yeah, well, of course, Gail Davis mentioned you, said she was so happy working with you, and any friend of Gail's is a friend of mine. We love her. Uh, same. I love Gail so much. So, yeah, it's. I mean, that was amazing that she mentioned me to you, and uh, yes, I love her. Love her so much. <laughs> and the topic is so good, brand audit. So, first of all, what the heck is a brand audit? Um, well, a brand audit is basically, um, I mean, there are a couple different ways to explain it. And it, it, it is typically something that like the big boys do and girls, the big boys and girls, <laughs> the larger companies. Um, but it is basically setting, stepping back and allowing you to understand how your target market is feeling about every aspect of your brand and allowing you to highlight areas for improvement. So a brand can feel, I think, a bit... Um, a little bit loose, a little bit like a cloud that exists in the sky that you can't, you know, like grab onto. Mm -hmm. And a brand audit really allows you to, to put some numbers on things, to really say what's working, what's not, and find the areas where your brand, where your funnel, where the path that people take, where every touch point that they have, you know, if something is broken. I appreciate that you said this is something that the big boys do. And then, of course, you added the big boys and the big girls. But the truth is, this is the kind of information that used to exist for big corporations, but never trickled down to those of us who run small interior design shops. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we all need to get more comfortable thinking of ourselves as a brand. Even if you're a single solopreneur, you're still a brand, right? Absolutely. I mean, if there's one thing that I would like to accomplish with this conversation, it is to, um, well, I'll say this. If you were to Google brand audit, 
um, I, I can guarantee that it would be a little overwhelming because the jargon would just come at you so fast. It is just really, it can be seemingly confusing, but what we can do today is just bring it down to earth. And what I want to share with you are some things that you can do in stages. So it's not like I'm either doing this entire crazy multi-step thing or I'm doing nothing. You know, um, there are things that you can do to start and then over time you can, you know, really take it further. So I definitely want to jump into how to do a brand audit, but the other question I'm curious about is, is there a good time to do a brand audit? I would say that a good time to do a brand audit would be if you are noticing that, as I said, something is broken, like, you know, your, your brand is, I don't know, not functioning properly. You know, you're not bringing in business in the way that you want to be. Um, or if you are currently expanding, you know, you're scaling up a little bit, or if you are about to rebrand. How do you know if your brand is broken? What, is that a thing? Like you could have a broken brand? <laughs> How do you, is there an x-ray? I didn't, I've never heard that before. <laughs> Does it have a limp? Um, I guess, like, I guess it's like better to say not that you have a broken brand, but there might be broken elements in your brand. You know. Um, so as we're talking about this, I'm going to talk probably a lot about touch points. So there are there are all multiple places where people encounter your brand, right? So it might be that they, you know, everybody starts never having heard of you, right? So the first touch point it could be social media, it could be a friend who's talking to them, it could be that they run across a blog post, whatever it might be. Whatever that touch point is, is it is it broken in some way? Is it not functioning properly? Is it not communicating clearly to the person who's receiving the information? Or visually, is it not you know um, building trust for them? Is okay. that I would say um, I'm going to rephrase it and say not that your brand is broken, your whole brand, but like, are do you have pieces of it that are broken that you can fix? Right. And so what you're saying right away, I think, is really important, which is I I got at some point that I was a brand, but I would post things on social media or I would put things out into the universe and I wasn't clear how what I was putting out was funneling back to my business. And that's what you're talking about. At various points, your messaging should be funneling into into getting you new customers. If that's the yes. goal. Okay. And so it could be, it could be broken. It could be sprained. It could be <laughs> sort of twisted and yeah. taking you down. Okay. So it's all about getting really clear about the whole point of doing the darn social media posts to begin with. Yeah. I mean, so actually that is step one of the whole thing is to, is to lay the foundation and decide, create a framework on, on this and decide, okay, so if, if the point of this is to get consistency, if the point of this is to communicate, you know, the same sort of messaging points across all touch points, then first you have to ask yourself, of course, what are we trying to say? What do we want it to look like? We have to just establish that first. So we want to ask some of those basic questions. And, you know, obviously you've heard terms like, you know, like you want to have a mission statement. You want to have a vision statement. For us, we, like when we work with clients, we really love talking specifically about messaging points. I just find messaging points to be so practical and specific. Um, so what we want to do is ask, okay, what is the messaging? What do we want? To, what is interesting or special? Or, um, like if I were looking at, you know, three different interior design firms or hearing about them, what is the narrative that we are creating about your business? And I could say, explain that as, oh, that's the interior design firm who, or that's the interior design firm that, what are you known for? Why are people hiring you? What, what is it? What is the message? Okay, now let's say I've just come to you and I'm an, an interior design professional. Oh, wait a minute. I really am an interior design professional. Um, <laughs> but let's say I've just hired you and you ask me that question and I come back at you with, I make beautiful rooms. Oh, I will say. Thank Meh. you. <laughs> right, um, like who doesn't? Like if you're listening right now, put your hand up if you make beautiful rooms. Like yeah. that can't be your message. No. That's no, a given. Cannot. Okay, no. good. Thank you. Yeah. So, so we don't, we, I would, ne what we don't do is ask you, what are your messaging points? Because that is a really, really hard question. What we do is ask you a million other questions that 
will that are are um, asked with the intention of digging up the gold, which it, which becomes your messaging points. So we're looking for three. So basically, we're looking for points of differentiation when it comes down to it. And um, when we're looking for those, we are looking for things that are desirable to your target client that are different from your competitors. So like we design beautiful rooms or we like make your space nice or, you know, we're nice to work with. Those are not points of differentiation. Um, and then is it doable? Is it something that you as a firm, as, a, as the owner can really dig into and like want to make true? Okay, so so um, we are going to talk about the fact that people can hire you, designers can hire you, and you will perform this brand audit. But let's say somebody's listening and they're not quite ready to do that yet. Yeah, what are yeah, what are some points yeah. of differentiation that would make a difference to someone? I'm assuming it would be something like I, you know, I specialize in penthouse condos. Is that one? Sure. Yeah. So it, I'll give you a bunch of examples. So it can be anything from, so, all right. So like people think in terms of niching, yes, it can be, it can be a niche, but you don't have to niche in that sense necessarily. It, all right, so it could be a specific target client. It could be an emphasis on a particular benefits of your services. It could be speci- some special credentials that you have. Um, maybe you really are innovative in your design solutions and no, not every designer can say that as we, as we both know, right? Like some designers are really innovative. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you have a unique process that is especially appealing to your target market. You know, like um, you work with, I mean, a lot of designers are like, yeah, I like working with busy dual income couples. That's pretty common. But have you created a process that really, really speaks to their needs? That's that's probably going to be different than your competitors who are just kind of like maybe just going through the motions doing the standard, standard stuff. It could be that you have a unique pricing structure. It could be that you have a, a different approach to timeline. Um, that you specialize in specific building types or rooms. Like I know a library designer. It could be that you're a kitchen designer, um, a special expertise in sourcing. Maybe you have the best sources. Um, your style of project management. You offer really stellar service. Uh, does that all? Does that all like jump? You know, <laughs> completely. Yeah, I know my yeah. point of differentiation is we can guarantee projects on time and on budget. That's yeah. unique. But if you're a business of design member, it's not unique because you can all have the same differentiation as I do. I think that you want a differentiation that allows you to charge more for the ideal customer who you want to serve. I mean, that's, that is it in a nutshell, right? Because we, the, what we don't want is for people to be comparing on price. So if you're giving them something else to bite off and chew, then they are not going to compare on price. Okay. So don't be a commodity have yes. a unique differentiation point. And I loved all the things you said. It could be a niche. You only do yachts. You only do kitchens. <laughs> it could be yes. a benefit. <laughs> like one of the benefits of working with us, another point I would say for my firm would be we want clients who don't want to lift a finger. So that's a benefit. You don't have to lift a finger. We will do yes. everything. You just have to write a check. And that is and that is specific because you know, I mean, there is the client that wants to go to lunch with you and go shopping with you who doesn't want to outsource. Right. So like it is, that is, that is specific. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stage one then is mining your brand for points of differentiation. Do I have that right? That's stage one. Yes. Um, so it's, I mean, it's really, it's laying the foundation in two ways. One, looking for the points of differentiation and, and I just want to add one, one little note there. Um, just, I don't know, just don't be afraid to say things. You know, I think in interior design, there's a lot of, uh, vagary. Is that a word? (laughs) Let's just Um, call it a word. Yes. Um, a lot of vigorosity, um, that that occurs where it's just Vagaliciousness. I'm sorry. Too much vagaliciousness out there. All right. Yes. This is, yes. So what kinds Um, of things would somebody be afraid to say? So, well, I mean, let's all think about like the typical interior design site that we hit. It's going to be, um, very often a big, beautiful image, right? And then nothing and not even a statement on what area they serve, you know, like sometimes you have to dig so hard to even find out, you know, are they, where are they? Are they in Atlanta or are they in Chicago? Like I have no idea until I happen to read three paragraphs into the about page. So 
um, my, just a, just as a sort of like, Hey, don't forget, like if you have some interesting points of differentiation, please say them. And we'll talk more about it. It's more, it, it, you, know, you can do more than just say them. We'll discuss that a little bit later, but put them out into the world. Don't be scared. <laughs> it's okay. good. People want All right. Um, Every, everything so then, is worth considering then. Yes. Um, so, and then the other thing is you just want to also be thinking about who your, who your target client is, because through this entire process, you know, we have to have them in mind, of course, and we can think about who is currently buying our services. And then we can also think about who we want to buy our services, because if you're doing an audit, you might as well think about who you want to be buying your services. Okay. Just as much. We're definitely going to move on to stage two, I promise. Let's do it. But a question yeah. for the person who's listening, who's fairly new, and the truth mm-hmm. of the matter is when I I was fairly new. I just wanted a customer. Did was sure. she breathing? Did she have a checkbook? <laughs> this is good. I'm ready to go. Is that a bad approach? What's um, if you're no, really think, hungry for work? What would you say to that that person? So, um, so it just so happens that because um, there, I, I, there's, there's a lot that my business has in common with your business because we're both designers. So I feel like I can speak to this even personally. I think in the beginning, yeah, reality is you got to just take work because how else are you going to know? who you want to work with until you have some experience. So I am all for just getting out there and doing it for a little while before you, I mean, unless you know, I mean, there are some people who are, you know, they have previous experience either building a business or in a related field or whatever, whatever it might be that they have a, they have a solid vision. Um, but for most designers, I, yes, I, I think it is fine and good and realistic to just get out there and, and do the work and find out what works for you. Find out what you're good at, find out what your process is. Okay, but do fine tune that. Like maybe you do that for a year, but you should start fine tuning that pretty quickly. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, awesome. Oh wow. Okay, stage two. All right. So here's where we get into like nerd land, but in the good way. So we want to, as I said, a, a brand can be like this like ephemeral thing, right? So we want to make it real. So we're going to list out all of the touch points. Looks like we had just a little audio glitch there, and Nicole begins to talk about various touch points, including your website, of course, your Google business page. And Nicole is encouraging each of us to ask our customers to review us there. I never thought of that. Brand touch points also include each of your social media channels and blog posts. Nicole can take it from here print ads and mailers, if you do such things, uh, press coverage, business cards, referral sources, a Google search for your business name, what is coming up when people do that, Um, other online reviews, networking events, um, you know, sales stuff, like if you have like print collateral that you're giving out um, during your sales process, customer service, what happens when someone reaches out because there's an issue, all of that stuff and more. So you really just want to brainstorm, literally go create a Google sheet or whatever and just list out in the column every point where people are touching your brand. Okay. If you, so if you're speaking at a home show, that's a point. If you're... Sure. Okay. All right. So that's a fairly straightforward exercise. Yeah. Okay. But, but pretty cool and important. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting to me about that is how many places your brand could get a touch point. There's a lot of places people can bump into you. I wouldn't right. have realized that. That's, that's a lot of places. That's a lot of places, and that's real, right? Like, I mean, you think of it as like, oh, my website and social media, but it is. It's so much more than that. It's how if you have an office and you have staff answering the phone, how's that going? <laughs> you know, like, or how how do they answer the phone? Ooh, Are and if you have right? an off if you have an office signage on the building, yes. When yes. when we bought a building. when we bought a building and put my name up on the sign, we immediately got business from it. I was shocked. I had no idea wow. people would just drive by and hire you. Like, wow. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's so interesting. Oh, congratulations! You bought a building. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, it's incredible. Yes, yeah. systems and procedures will get you a building for sure. Oh my gosh, <laughs> guys, <laughs> I'm feeling inspired. Um, okay, okay, so, stage so, three. So stage I'm assuming two. stage two is just to make that list. Yeah, and, and okay. like, isn't that something, right? Just to make that list. All right, so stage three, review each touch point for, I'm going to say, go ahead and make, like, let's be literal about this, make two columns. 
three, let's say three columns, um, and you want to review each touch point for, for clarity and consistency and content, but the three columns are the look and feel, first of all. So like if we already, we've established back in, we didn't really go much into the visual back in stage one, but we, you know, we want to make sure that we know our visual branding back in stage one, two, back when we're like creating a framework. So we want to look and make sure that the logo colors, fonts, your headshots, your photo quality, your photo selection, all of that is on point at each touch point where there is a visual element. So you're going to review it and guaranteed, and, and I know I could do the same thing. We're doing our audit now, you know, in the process of rebranding, like you're going to find things where you're like, whoa, <laughs> like that's old. I touched that four years ago and never looked at it again. And people are actually looking at it. Uh-oh, yeah. better fix it, you know? Photos too, right? Like your, your headshot. Yeah. I'm shocked how often you have to take photos. I'm like, really? Again? Ugh, <laughs> I hate that. But yeah, you look back and you're like, oh wow I don't that's not what I look like anymore I know I just I'm in the process of replacing mine I had like the shortest hair in my old one and now I have like long hair but yeah it is it's funny getting headshots it's funny as a human it's a funny thing to get headshots you're like who do I think I am (laughs) it's really something um okay so next how does each touch point sound so in in this one I'm referring to brand voice so the tone and personality on social media on your website copy um but I think this gets really Really interesting when you're talking about like the little baby little touch points like um, confirmation pages and like 404 error pages on your website and the stuff that you forget about that you might be just going to, with a default on that feels jarring and not on brand for people when they encounter it. So for example, if someone is signing up for your email list and you have everything, let's say you're using MailChimp, like a lot of people, right? And you have the default stuff going on. Are they signing up and being taken to some sort of like default MailChimp branded page? Page, you know, that's like, thank you for signing up. That has no brand voice and no visuals that are online with your brand. Mm-hmm. Or did you do, you know, a, is it redirecting to a custom page that feels on brand and has something in your voice? It's, right. You know, things make a difference. Right. And I could see where that's like a little bit of a sprain. It's maybe not a break, but it's a bit no, of a sprain. No, it's not a break yet. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Okay. This is not a a life or death situation. But this is a really good thing to talk about because I will admit to having a split personality. My brand is pretty clear, I think, when you go to my website. But when I go to Instagram, I just pretty much talk about tequila. (laughs) <laughs> or super fun things I'm doing. Am I, is that bad? I just can't be disciplined all the time. I have to let my hair down, Nicole. Help. Oh, but that's part of your brand then. I mean. Tequila? Really? Well, I mean, well, you be wow. like, I would, all right. So like. <laughs> really? It depends. Like if there is like a fun element to your, um, you are your brand, obviously, yeah. in your case, yeah. for real. Um, so yeah, making, humanizing yourself. I mean. There's there's an argument to be made. For okay, that. so can um, I on my Kimberly Selden Design Group webpage? Should I have tequila recipes no, that will make no, you happy? Well, uh, so let's talk about that. There, there is a difference in the tone between uh, what goes onto a Twitter account oh. and what goes onto a homepage onto homepage copy. There's even a difference in the tone between homepage copy and a blog post. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we we consider our brand voice, but we also consider the context that we're in. Okay. So there, it can vary. Now, one thing I will throw at you though, is you do want to make sure that you in, are injecting your messaging. Even when you're talking about tequila, get your messaging in there. You know, I mean, let's not waste this, this time in front of your audience. Let's I don't. always be, you know, I, you I just see. don't, I just <laughs> don't, but okay. So <laughs> it is, part, I tell like, myself, no, that, well, I think of Instagram as a place that I talk to other designers. So I let my hair down. Yeah. So yeah, okay. I don't message other, de- like I know other designers are not going to hire me. Um, oh, but I'm, other, but other designers buy your stuff. I mean, you, you, you have products for designers, right? Business so like, of design. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a very serious and I do post some business of design stuff. Oh, so suddenly this has turned into personal therapy. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> but maybe some of you are struggling as well. So so I think what I probably need to do is, is you know what I need to do, Nicole? 
What? I need to do a brand audit on my Insta. Yes. Okay, done. Okay, moving on. I will do my homework, everyone. I promise. Okay, thank you, Nicole, by the way. This is awesome. You're welcome. Um, okay, so so speaking of back, moving on to the thing that we just mentioned, messaging. So you're looking at all of those touch points and saying, like, is my messaging being communicated? Again, you can look at the context. So it doesn't have to be, like, we don't have to be, like, crazy about this where it's, like, everything's the same. Um, you have to look at the context, but yes, is, are you taking the opportunities to in, incorporate your messaging where possible? So messaging can be just to touch on this. It's not just saying things. I mean, there, there is some messaging, for example, if a messaging point of yours is that you are legit fun to work with, right? That is not the kind of messaging point that you're going to say out loud because it sounds silly. <laughs> like just like something you don't say out loud, something to demonstrate, and uh, and you live them and you insert them into your processes right. and you highlight testimonials that talk about how you're fun to work with in that case and you tell stories that illustrate it. It's not in your tagline, okay. right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, so it's not, when we say we're incorporating our messaging into these touch points, it's not literally like blah, 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 and we're fun to work with. It's like maybe you're demonstrating it. Um, by like having a 404 error page that's like kind of fun, you know? So does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know any 404 error pages that are fun, but that would just surprise, oh. that would surprise and delight me rather oh, than I'm, like... That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So may I suggest that you Google, um, I don't know, probably like fun 404 error pages when we're done with this call. <laughs> I'm so excited. This is great. <laughs> you will encounter a treasure trove of fun 404 error pages. It is a thing. It's like, I feel like I just fell through the rabbit hole. That's, that's super <laughs> cool. Okay. So stage three is really important. You have to take time and you have to do some deep dives on each and every single one of those touch points. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So then step stage four, when, you know, once you've gotten some consistency and you're feeling like you, you haven't forgotten about anything, there's nothing that we leave five years ago. That's weird it's out in the world. Then you want to wherever possible, assign a metric to track the performance of a touch point. So this is where we're saying, okay, let's say, um, we, let's say we're talking about your website. Um, what can we track with your website? First of all, I'm going to just say it now that you do need to have Google analytics installed on your website just to like prepare for this. Um, I know that many people who are listening probably, you know, like maybe like there are some people out there who have Google analytics installed and just have like never opened it or, or did once because it's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's the dashboard is crazy. It's, it's literally too much information. Right. But I will, I'll tell you where to focus. Um, and then there are some people who are like, yeah, like Google analytics is my jam. Or maybe they wouldn't say that because people <laughs> say it that way. They would be like, I like Google Analytics. It is very useful. <laughs> um, so whether you have it installed or not, get it on there and then open it up. And my advice to you would be to focus, literally just look for the word acquisition and just start there because that is going to tell you how all of your social media platforms are performing as far as getting traffic to your website. So just click on, open up your Google Analytics after it's been tracking for a while, click on acquisition. It's going to have a breakdown of different categories. It'll have like social, referral, direct, you know, how, whatever else it has. Click on social and then it'll break down all of your different social media platforms, how much traffic is coming to your website, because that is an important metric. There are other metrics you can look at with your social media. Of course, you can look at your engagement. You can look at how many followers or, you know, how many fans you have or whatever, whatever it might be. But when it comes down to it, I think how much traffic traffic they send to your website is a good one to start looking at if you're going to just start looking at something. And to track that kind of month over month, right? So we have it yeah. set up and I'm by no means am I an expert, but automatically I have some numbers that come to me on a monthly basis. That's great. So you That's can awesome. set up automation to, so you can track it over month, month over month and say, Hey, this new strategy that I learned yes. from Nicole is working because I'm getting the following bump in my numbers. Yes. Yes. And then we'll take it one step further and okay, so cool, we're getting traffic, but yeah, that's great that you have it set up to, to receive that month over month. That's perfect. Um, what you want to do then is is ask yourself, okay, so oh my gosh, surprise, like like I, I had I have so much traffic coming from Pinterest. That's like spoiler alert, what everyone finds out. <laughs> like that's right. 
<laughs> that is what you will find out. Nothing from Instagram, essentially, barely, and everything from Pinterest. Surprise. So um, you're going to find that out. But then the question becomes like, all right, so I've got like some traffic coming from my Facebook page and like, um, you know, a lot from Pinterest. But what percentage of these people are actually converting, are actually doing the thing that I want them to do? And the way that you figure that out is by setting up goals in Google Analytics, which is, do you have goals set up, Kimberly? Do you, do you track I have, those? I have no idea. My team probably okay. does, but I probably don't see them, but I'm, I'm going to look into this. Yeah. So what, what goals allow you to do is track conversions. So you can track, I mean, probably the two main things that you would want to track are number one, what percentage of people are, let's say, filling out a contact form, you know, um, you know, that visit the site. Now that's not a perfect record of conversion because you've got people maybe calling you. It depends like what, and you can do call tracking. That's another option there, but we're getting, we don't want to get like overwhelming here. Um, but you can track at least something, you know, what is it mm-hmm. that the indicator that someone has taken action on your site. And then number two would be people signing up for your mailing list. And that's a pretty easy one to track because all you're going to set up is like people who visit, let's say you set up a thank you page that people get to after they've signed up for the mailing list. Google analytics can track what percentage of people hit that thank you page done. Now, you know, what percentage of people sign up for your mailing list who visit, um, who visit your website. And you can see, you can look in Google analytics, if you dig around a little bit and see what percentage of those, you know, where they're coming from. So you can see like, Oh, you know, this many people from Pinterest signed up or converted versus this many people from Facebook. So it might look like, like Pinterest is amazing, but like if you're getting better conversion from Facebook, for example, then you know to focus your efforts more over there. Okay. So the thing that strikes me here, well, this is really needy, great information. So thank you. But it occurs to me that maybe for 20, years of my business, I did not even have something for them to convert to. In other words, I had a website, but there was no call to action. There was no asking for business. There was no like, hey, sign up if you're interested. Give me your email if you're interested in a consultation. Right. Uh, well, so, so the email thing is usually, you know, building an email list so that you can nurture leads so that someone who is, you know, they visited your website, maybe they're a referral or maybe they got there. However, it doesn't matter. And at, they're not ready at this exact moment to go book you for the, you know, the gut reno that you're hoping for. Right. But if you can get them to sign up for your email list, you can nurture that lead stay in front of them. I mean, just by getting in front of them over and over again, they stay top of mind and they might even refer you more often because you're staying top of mind. So this stuff does, it is absolutely helpful. Um, but as far as going back to your question about a call to action for the site in general, sort of like a, you know, what they should do, the, the rule, the name of the game with web design and with all like, you know, quote user experience is just to make whatever it is that you want a person to do on your website, you just want to make it as easy as possible. So that's all, you know, like you want to let them know what's going to happen. First of all, you want to let them know what to do so that they don't have to think, never make them think. And then you want to let them know what's going to happen next. You know, if you have someone filling out a contact form, you want to say, okay, you're going to hear back from someone within two business days. They're not thinking it's going to happen in the next half hour Mm -hmm. and they're disappointed, you know? While you uh, may have been doing totally fine without a specific call to action on your site, I can tell you that you're going to give people a better brand experience if you make things easier for them. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's so easy for me to see with business of design, when people come to the website, business of design, we're asking them, do you want to get our newsletter once a month? And so in that case, we're going to need your email address. So that's what we're asking for. It's pretty simple. It's right. really hard to see to ask somebody, do you want me to gut reno your whole house? Do you want to spend a million dollars with my firm? So what's the baby step to that? I guess it's, are you interested in a consultation in a two hour consultation? Yeah. So, um, speaking of lead nurture sequences, it can be really useful to, to use your you know, to get someone on the email list, right? So that you have that opportunity to continue the discussion beyond that moment. So they're not leaving and gone forever. And then really, yeah, exactly what you said. You want to lead them towards sort of a low stakes version of your services, because that's going to be the easiest thing to sell. I think in general, it's important to always be just focusing on the next step with people, you know, like just get them to the next step. Don't talk about anything, not don't talk about anything else, but just, you know, that's your goal. Like get them to find, get them to the service, whatever it might be. 
That totally makes sense to me. Wow. Okay. There's a stage five. What on earth is left to do? I'm exhausted. What else? What what more do you want from me, Nicole? <laughs> <laughs> Snap out of it, Kimberly. Um, okay, so we want to uh, now, now that we've, the weak spots that are probably pretty obvious now that we're tracking things. And I just want to go back and say, you know, there are going to be touch points there where you're like, you know, we're talking about, I don't know, emails that the client gets during the um, onboarding process that comes stuff like that like there's no metric other than they're opening them and maybe getting back to you you know but like you can use customer feedback at the end of the process or during the process casually Mm -hmm. asking like how's everything going with you know how's the communication is everything smooth for you is it understandable like just to gather information so i just Mm -hmm. want to throw that out there not everything will have a hard number um so you have to think creatively so step five you want to create action steps so if something is not working then you want to say okay i have a theory you know, I'm thinking that if we try this instead, or we improve this, or we, you know, make this a specific, you know, tweak this, this communication that we think it'll improve the situation, you know, um, and then try it, experiment. I mean, marketing is about experimentation and testing. That's, that's all there is to it. So it sounds to me also like the list you develop of things you need to take action on could be significant. So it might be helpful to really decide what's the most important thing to take action on. I would think yes, like getting point. that consultation, that paid customer, that how did you refer to it? Um, a low stakes version of what you're ultimately selling, getting to that seems like the most important thing. And then everything else can happen following that, but tackle that one thing and make that one thing happen. Is that probably a good strategy if you're on your own? Yeah. I mean, so I would say just as an overall sort of like the plan, what's the plan stand for this whole thing. You want to like do just don't get, you know, first do make your, write out all your touch points and then get the consistency and then like take a breath, (laughs) you know, like don't, this is not like, let's do this all at once, you know, get that consistency up front and then, and then take a breath. And then as you said, like just address one thing. Now one could argue that yes, you could go that way where you're addressing the sort of like, um, the, the lead nurture stuff where you're trying to get people to sign up for that first service. Or, and this is literally just an or, you could really work on your um, on your like onboarding and the stuff that happens while you're servicing the client, because that is going to really probably improve your rate of referral, which right. might be a lower you know lower hanging fruit because this is interior design after all. So, right. so that second category is what we do at Business of Design for sure. That's all we do at Business of Design. Yeah. So just um, go do. Yeah. Do the Kimberly stuff. Yeah. 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 But maybe it's time to do the Nicole stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I need to do some Nicole stuff. I'm pretty excited, actually, to tackle it. <laughs> it's fun. I just know for me, well, for, for example, if I were to hire Nicole, I would want you to take action on everything today. <laughs> yeah. But if I'm going to do it myself, I'm going to have to be more disciplined and select one thing to make progress on. And then what I've noticed is when I do make progress on that one thing that seemed really hard or even impossible, it gives me motivation and courage and confidence to tackle the next thing yeah and we don't we don't even we don't take action on everything at once i'll tell you the way that we do it we look at um touch points during the brand discovery process and then in the process of you know designing and building the new website and like you know coming up with all of the actual stuff you know that sort of like puts the message out to the world um then we are addressing a lot of those inconsistencies but then we it depends like we don't work with every client ongoing after that only some so sometimes we would just send you off with like a hey here here's here's what you need to look at um and then um other times we would work ongoing with clients on uh, addressing a couple of those issues no one does it all at once we are not not we're not like a huge corporation any of us you know um i we don't work with those that kind of scale of clients so there nobody has big enough teams that they can be like all right let's do this all at once we have to be realistic right okay um stage there's i lied i thought stage five it just seemed oh, like just that's where you progress. stop it's stage <laughs> stage six is important yeah track your progress because yeah. how, otherwise you your efforts might be wasted yeah absolutely so it's just basically saying like 
now that we've um, created a plan, let's just keep an eye on like what's going on over time. You know, like we did, we take, we took action on something because we had a theory that it would improve a situation. Now, now we need to revisit it and see if it really works. And if it didn't, that's okay because you can take a different action and try something else. You have a class coming up. When does that start and what is going to happen in that class? Um, so that we ran this a couple of months ago. It's the branding masterclass for interior designers. The, the way that we're running it this time, and we're going to change the format the next round, but this time we're doing it this way again, where it's an intimate group. We meet once a week for six weeks, and we basically, by the end of it, you know everything about everything about your brand is defined, um, and then you know exactly what to do with all of the stuff that has been defined. So if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know what my messaging is. Um, that is something that we would work with in the class. I would take you through, rather than doing it one-on-one like we would in brand discovery, I would take you through as a small group um, the process of defining your messaging. And then we would also work on defining your visual branding, whatever is lacking. Some people, you know, most people have a logo, for example, but maybe they don't have a full color palette. We get into all that stuff. Um, and defining your brand voice and then really digging into um, my literally my favorite thing which is um, how to communicate all of that stuff sort of like three-dimensionally so everything from you know making sure that um, you're telling stories that you know we talked a little bit about this before like telling stories to illustrate it um, looking at your systems to make sure that your systems are sort of like reinforcing your messaging um, all of the stuff that is, um, you know, the choosing testimonials that reflect the messaging that you want to put out into the world, image selection, all that stuff, so that it's all just a three-dimensional thing that people get. They're not just reading it on your website. Very cool. And the and it, so it's six weeks, and, and I'm assuming it's an online meeting. It is. Zoom. Zoom. Yes. We love Zoom. Okay. And what is the cost for that? Uh, $7.97. So if you're listening and you think 2019 is the year you need to get your brand together, this could be a really great resource for you. I know uh, firsthand that you can build a website or you can build a website. You can build a website (laughs) that really is actionable and has clients want to hire you. So I do think it's worthwhile making sure that whomever you hire to build your website knows that the end goal is to sell something, to sell your services. So that seems really smart to me. And I'm super grateful to Gail for introducing us. We like to end every episode with something we call design intervention. And this is an opportunity to share with the listeners a a game-changing, life-saving system or strategy that's helped you as a business owner. It does not have to have anything to do with the brand audit. Um, So something you would say is like that million-dollar bit of advice that someone threw at you about running your company. What comes to mind? Oh, gosh. So I just recently went to a conference in my industry, and I heard someone speak who's... She's actually a branding person. Her name is Pia Silva. And she was talking about this concept of um, deposits and withdrawals as far as your client relationship goes. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God. That is... She was like putting words on a thing that I've always felt but never said out loud. And I just... I can't stop thinking about it and talking about it ever since then. Um, Just this concept of, and and this actually, I mean, this does actually align with the brand audit. You know, if you, from the very beginning, every experience that the client has with you is either a deposit, as far as goodwill goes, or a withdrawal. And withdrawals, unfortunately, kind of way more, we all know that. Um, But that's why you need to have a lot of deposits. You know, like, is it, is the contact form giving them uh, an error message? That's a withdrawal. Is it, um, did you just give them a great experience when, you know, when they, when you emailed all of the, like, we're going to get started, what, what happens next? That's a deposit. And that concept I think is, I don't know, a little bit life-changing. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> I think that's an incredible concept. I think of that in terms of capital, um, building trust, for example. You put in lots of deposits in the trust account, and then you do yes. one thing that's sort of hinky, and you deposit, you withdraw a whole bunch of those deposits, not just one deposit, but right. a huge number of those deposits. So deposits and withdrawals. I absolutely freaking love that concept. Thank you so much. Thank you to Pia Silva.
<laughs> well, I love also, you can tell Nicole has a lot of integrity, so she gave credit to the person she heard it from, so that's important. And the information you shared with us was extremely generous because I know you make a living doing this kind of brand auditing for people. So I'm excited for some of our Business of Design listeners to sign up with Nicole and share your experience. And Nicole, I hope this is just the first time we get a chance to talk. Uh, I look forward to other touch points with you. Yeah, other touch points. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. It's been so nice to talk with you. Have a great day. Thank you for being part of the Business of Design community. If you love what we do, please show your support by subscribing to the podcast and rating our efforts. Remember, you can be a part of the podcast by sharing your comments, ideas, and questions via the BOD hotline at 416-780-9187, extension 107, or by sending an MP3 file to info at businessofdesign.com. And when you're ready to transform your business and your life, sign up for a monthly or annual membership. Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today.